Hello, you're watching News Mongolia on MNB World, and I'm your host, Jargal Ma Tufshin Jargal. On the News Mongolia today, Enhancing anticipatory action for zot risk reduction, the Food and Agriculture Organization and Ministry of Finance lead key conference. Flu and viral infections surge by 10% compared to last year. Miat launches first scheduled flight to the Ho Chi Minh City. For the news, stay tuned. On December 9, 2024, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Ministry of Finance hosted a pivotal conference titled Enhancing the Anticipatory Action for Disaster Risk Reduction, Role of Index-Based Livestock Insurance at the State Palace's Ikhmongot Hall. The event attracted over 200 participants, including government representatives, herders, insurance companies, and international experts. It centered on the role of index-based livestock insurance in mitigating zot risks and the proposed legal amendments to improve the system. State Secretary of Finance Jay Kambat opened the conference highlighting new IBLI provisions enabling partial advance payouts to safeguard herders during slow onset zot conditions. The FAO's acting representative, Vinod Ahuja, stressed the economic value of anticipatory action, citing a return of 7 USD for every dollar invested, while underscoring the need for greater inclusivity and trust in IBLI. Experts delivered key presentations on topics ranging from anticipatory tools and zot risk assessments to IBLI's enhanced coverage under legal reforms. Speakers included representatives from the FAO, the National Emergency Management Agency, and the Information and Research Institute of Meteorology, Hydrology, and Environment. An open discussion session allowed herders to share experiences and expectations for IBLI improvements. The event concluded with closing remarks from Finance Minister Bei Zhaxlong, followed by a group photo session. The conference instigated a significant step towards bolstering Mongolia's resilience to climate-related challenges, ensuring the protection of herders' livelihoods. Health authorities report a 10% rise in flu and influenza cases compared to the same period last year, signaling growing public health concerns. Last week alone, over 21,000 individuals were diagnosed with viral infections. Details as follows. Last week alone, over 21,000 individuals were diagnosed with viral infections with more than 9,600 requiring hospitalization. Among the hospitalized, 3,000 cases were identified as pneumonia. Alarmingly, 50 to 70 percent of the affected patients are children under the age of 5. A common virus known as influenza has been identified as a significant cause of pneumonia in the population. Experts are urging parents to be vigilant about early symptoms in the young children and take precautionary measures to prevent severe complications. The healthcare system is currently focused on managing the surge and public awareness campaigns are being emphasized to curb further spread. Tests conducted on hospitalized children, totaling 109 samples, revealed that 18% were positive for the seasonal influenza, a H1N1 virus. Additionally, two cases of SARS, COV-2, were identified among the patients. Experts highlight that air pollution is a significant contributing factor to the surge in respiratory infections among children. Poor air quality exacerbates the vulnerability of young children as their developing immune systems are less equipped to handle pollutants. In particular, nitrogen dioxide and other toxins in polluted air can irritate the respiratory system, making it easier for viruses like seasonal influenza, A, H1N1, and sars cov COVID-2 to infect. Research shows that long-term exposure to polluted air weakens lung function and increases susceptibility to severe outcomes from respiratory illnesses, including pneumonia. Urban areas with higher pollution levels report greater hospitalization rates among children. Addressing air quality is vital in mitigating the impact of infections and reducing the burden on healthcare systems. 
Air pollution is a major contributor to various health conditions, with studies showing it is linked to 31.4% of cardiac arrest cases, 31% of cardiovascular diseases, including strokes, 18% of phenomenia cases, and 13.3% of chronic bronchitis. The inhalation of polluted air laden with fine particulate matter PM2.5 and harmful gases exacerbates these conditions by triggering inflammation, reducing oxygen delivery, and compromising overall respiratory and cardiovascular health. This underscores the urgent need for effective measures to improve air quality and mitigate the public health impact of pollution. Health officials urge measures such as improved air monitoring, stricter pollution controls and public awareness campaigns to protect vulnerable populations, especially children. You're watching News Mongolia. Now let's take a look at Mongolian current affairs. Miat Mongolian Airlines successfully inaugurated its first scheduled flight to Ho Chi Minh City, marking the beginning of regular Ulaanbaatar Ho Chi Minh City flights. The launch of this scheduled service is expected to significantly contribute to the enhancements of trade, economic ties, transport logistics, and tourism cooperation between Mongolia and Vietnam. It is anticipated to increase passenger flow between the two countries. Miat plans to operate this route twice a week, on Tuesdays and Fridays, with 292 passengers on board the inaugural flight. The event coincides with the 17th anniversary of the development of Mongolia's tourism industry. In line with the government's Visit Mongolia Year initiative, the number of tourists and air travelers visiting Mongolia has seen consistent growth in recent years. Ho Chi Minh City, a major hub for the economy, industry and tourism in Southeast Asia and globally, is expected to strengthen passenger and cargo transport connectivity as flight operations stabilize. The inaugural ceremony was attended by the State Secretary of the Ministry of Road and Transport Development, Is Bolt, Vietnamese Ambassador to Mongolia, Nguyen Dong Tang, and other officials who saw off the first group of passengers. Here is the currency exchange rates provided by Mongol Bank. Next, our program will turn our attention to foreign news, partnered with international news agencies. South Korean police said they sent officers to search President Yoon suk Yeol's office on Wednesday as part of an intensifying investigation following his sudden and short-lived martial law decree. It wasn't immediately clear if they began searches. <laughs> We are discussing the investigation team's entry with the presidential office and trying to figure out the reasons why the investigation team was denied access to the office. Some observers earlier say that the presidential security service won't likely permit searches of Yoon's office, citing a law that prohibits searches of sites with state secrets without approval from those in charge of those areas. Yoon on Saturday apologized over the martial law decree, saying that he won't avoid legal or political responsibility for it. The leader of Yoon's ruling party later vowed to arrange the president's stable exit from office, saying the party will coordinate with cabinet members over state affairs and that Yoon will be sidelined from duties. The comments were criticized as unrealistic and unconstitutional, but caused widespread questions about who is in charge of South Korea and its military at a time of heightened tensions with North Korea. The Justice Ministry on Tuesday banned Yoon from leaving the country as he faces investigations. Paraguay President Santiago Pena addressed Israel's parliament Wednesday as part of a visit to the country to attend the reopening of the country's embassy in Jerusalem. The decision to reopen the embassy in Jerusalem and recognize the city as the capital of Israel is a diplomatic win for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. 
Israel annexed East Jerusalem in 1967 in a move not recognized by the international community, and most countries have placed their embassies in Tel Aviv. The embassy is set to open Thursday. Pena's move was welcomed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli President Isaac Herzog, along with other Israeli leaders. Netanyahu called Pena's move a courageous promise and said he deserved every blessing. Alongside the series of agreements that will be signed during this visit, something no less central is happening. Your courageous promise, my friend the President, to move the Paraguayan embassy to Jerusalem begins to take shape and you deserve every blessing. Tomorrow we will inaugurate together the embassy of Paraguay in our eternal capital and that will happen not for the first time but for the second time. So I say here today that without an embassy in Jerusalem, diplomatic relations with Israel do not have a real heart, do not have a real soul. With this move, our historic friendship will once again have the palpitating heart. It is also a decision that I sincerely hope will inspire other nations to do the same. Paraguay had an embassy in Jerusalem in 2018 under former President Horosia Kart. That embassy was moved back to Tel Aviv by Kart's successor, Maria Abdel Benitez, prompting Israel to close its embassy in Asuncion. Israel reopened that embassy in September. The French government on Wednesday said the fall of Syrian President Bashar Assad's government brought hope to people in the country. The Syrian government fell early Sunday in a stunning end to the 50-year rule of the Assad family after a sudden rebel offensive sprinted across government-held territory and entered the capital in 10 days. About the situation in Syria, the country is going through a major turning point, a major turning point for the country and for the region, the end of a criminal regime. These developments bring hope even if we do not ignore the Islamist risk in the context. We must condition our support to a pacifist transition which does not leave room for extremists. Bregen also stressed French President Emmanuel Macron was seeking a political alliance to get France out of a deadlock following the resignation of ousted Prime Minister Michel Barney. About the Mercosur and the signing that took place a few days ago, the President of the Republic insisted it wasn't the end of the game and it was just the beginning. France will clearly work to ensure there's blocking minority in the time to come. Barney resigned last week after a historic no-confidence vote prompted by budget disputes at the National Assembly, which left France without a functioning government. Prudence said that Macron had noted there was currently no broader alliance between political groups and that it now remains to be seen whether some would be ready to broaden this alliance or to agree on a principle of not voting and a no-confidence motion. A conservative appointed in September, Barney became the shortest-serving prime minister in France's modern republic. His government has been charged with handling current affairs pending the appointment of a new prime minister by Macron. All right, that's all for today. Thank you for staying with us. We'll see you tomorrow with more news and updates. Goodbye.